Hello, my name is Craig Richards and today I'm going to be giving you a whirlwind tour of quantum computing. The subject of quantum computing is too large and too complex to provide any meaningful depth in just one presentation. So through this presentation I hope to convey just enough that you can see why it is such an incredibly interesting and potentially incredibly important subject worthy of further exploration. While the foundations of quantum computing are quantum mechanics, you will not need any background in quantum mechanics or physics in general to grasp how quantum computing works and the huge future potential for quantum computing. Our agenda for the rest of this presentation will cover what is quantum computing? How is quantum computing different? The huge potential for quantum computing. Quantum computing is real and it's here now quantum computing realities, and what's next. So, what is quantum computing and a quantum computer? A simple definition, it is the use of quantum mechanical phenomena that have no classical counterpart for the purpose of computation. A lot of people are under the mistaken impression that it is simply faster or that it is the next level of CPU scaling. It is not. It is fundamentally different. David Deutsch is one of the founding pioneers of quantum computing, and he describes it as a distinctively new way of harnessing nature. So let's explore the timeline of quantum computing. It divides roughly into two 20-year periods, the 20 years from 1980 to 2000, and from 2000 until now. This first 20 years is essentially laying the foundation. While there are many contributing discoveries before 1980, it really is not until 1980 that the concept really starts to solidify. In 1980, Richard Feynman observed that it appeared to be impossible to efficiently simulate an evolution of a quantum system on a classical computer, and he proposed a basic model for a quantum computer. In 1985, David Deutsch at the University of Oxford describes the first universal quantum computer. In 1992, David Deutsch and Richard Joza proved that a quantum computer could solve some well-defined computational task more efficiently than any classical computer, called the deutsch joza algorithm. In 1994, Peter Shaw proposes an algorithm that can theoretically break many of the crypto systems in use today its invention sparked tremendous interest in quantum computing. In 1998, we then see the first experimental de demonstration of a quantum algorithm running on a real quantum computer, solving the Deutsche algorithm with just two qubits. From 2000 onwards, things really start to take off and we see the growth in the hardware, the physical computers themselves that are needed to realize the theoretical potential discovered during the previous 20 years. Some things worth noting on this timeline are, in 2001, we see the first execution of Shaw's algorithm on an actual quantum computer. It was very limited, just factoring the number 15. In 2009, the first universal programmable quantum computer is unveiled at NIST. In 2016, IBM released the Quantum Experience, an online interface to their superconducting system. In the space of just 18 years, we've gone from the first two-qubit system to an online instance of quantum computing. From 2016 through to 2020 onward, there is a real explosion in the development in quantum computing, with major vendors such as Microsoft, Google, Intel, all launching programs to implement online quantum computers. So what are we talking about when we talk about quantum computing? In this presentation, we will be discussing the quantum circuit model, which is the model being developed by IBM, Google, IonQ, and others. In this model, a program is constructed as if we were creating a circuit representing the progressive application of quantum gates. There is another form of quantum computing that you may have heard of called quantum annealing. D-Wave are the main player in this market, promoting this model. The D-Wave solution is tailored to solving optimization problems. 
The process is like finding the minima of an equation that represents the optimal solution to our problem. At the moment, annealing is not considered a universal computing model. So what does a quantum computer actually look like? Well, you're not likely to have one on your desk anytime soon. They are big, delicate, and require very specialized hardware and environmental protection. The picture on the left shows one of IBM's quantum computers. Most of the equipment in this room is control and measurement systems and refrigeration and isolation systems. The, the qubits operate at about 15 millikelvin which is almost absolute zero, minus 273 degrees Celsius. The image on the right shows what is inside the big cylinder on the left. It's referred to as the chandelier. The quantum processor is just a small block at the very bottom of the chandelier. The rest is for cooling and for guiding microwave control pulses and detecting energy changes in the qubits. The best way to describe quantum computing is to compare it to what we already know, classical computing. So let's look at some of the key differences. In our classical computer, the basic unit of information is a bit in the state 1 or 0. If we want to calculate with our 1s and zeros, we apply logic gates. See the table on the right for the common Boolean logic we can apply to our bits. A classical computer's state is determined by the state of all its bits, so that a computer with n bits can exist in one of 2 to the power of n possible states. So for n equals 3, we can have 8 possible states from 000, 010, 100, and so on up to 111. But the important thing is that we can only be in one of these possible 8 states at any one time. If we want to implement our classical bit, there is really only one go-to technology. That's the transistor, a simple switch that allows us to represent the one or zero as the presence or the absence of a voltage level. Now let's compare the classical bit to its quantum cousin, the quantum bit or qubit. Like a classical bit, there are two measurable states, zero and one. But unlike the classical bit, the qubit state can't be represented by a simple value like a voltage level. The state of our qubit is represented by a unit vector. The equivalent of our classical gates are unitary matrices, and we calculate through the repeated application of these matrices to our qubits, which are vectors. The table on the right shows some common quantum operators or gates. The X gate is equivalent to a NOT gate and inverts the state from 0 to 1 or from a 1 to a 0. The Hadamard gate is used to put our qubit into a superposition state and there is no classical equivalent of such a gate. The C NOT gate or the control NOT gate performs the inversion function of the X gate but only when the control bit is set to 1. These three gates are probably the three most important gates that you will come across constantly as you're starting to do an introduction to quantum computing. Unlike a classical bit, a qubit can be prepared as a linear combination of both the base states. Also, a qubit can be implemented using many different quantum mechanical systems. There are many different qubit modalities or ways of implementing physical qubits. The most popular at the moment are ion traps and superconducting qubits. Ion traps use electromagnetic forces to suspend ions in free space and lasers to set and read their state information. IonCube is the best known company developing this type of qubit technology. Superconducting circuits use a more traditional silicon lithography but using circuit material that exhibit quantum phenomena at superconducting temperatures. IBM and Google are the best known proponents of this technology. Both ion traps and superconducting circuits require temperatures close to absolute zero. While ion traps and superconductors are the most popular modalities at the moment, much research is still ongoing on the other ways of implementing qubits. 
Physical qubits, regardless of their modality, have a common mathematical representation. Formally, a qubit is a unit vector in C2, or two-dimensional complex vector space. This means that the alpha and the beta in our vector are complex numbers. This notation on the left is called Dirac notation or bracket notation and it's simply a convenient way of representing a vector. As mentioned previously, our qubit can be represented as a linear combination of two basis vectors. Here our qubit Q is represented by alpha ket0 plus beta ket1 where alpha and beta are complex numbers representing the probability amplitude of the qubit being in that basis state. This is important for when we measure this qubit, the probability amplitude will determine the most likely basis state that the measurement will reduce to. As probabilities have to sum up to zero, our qubit is constrained by the following normalization equation. The absolute value of alpha squared plus the absolute value of beta squared sum to 1. You will often see a qubit represented in a different notation. The block sphere is a geometric device for plotting quantum states. Euler's theorem allows us to substitute the complex numbers in our original state equation with two real numbers, theta and phi. This is a useful tool for visualizing the state of a single qubit. Some people may already be familiar with this similar model from optics called the Poincaré sphere. With a very brief introduction to some of the terminology and concepts, we can now look at the core difference between classical and quantum computing, the application of superposition, entanglement, and interference to implement quantum parallelism. Looking at the 3-bit classical system on the left, if we want to change the state of our system, that is to calculate something, we can perform logical operations in sequence, increasing the time taken to arrive at a new state. If we want to do that faster, we can duplicate our 3-bit system by adding additional hardware and do some of the operations in parallel. This is called classical parallelism. But either way, to increase our ability to calculate, we must add more hardware or more time or both. In comparison, the quantum system through superposition and entanglement can be in a linear combination of all eight states at the same time. The advantage here might not be immediately obvious, but it's very important to understand. Our three classical bits can only be in a single state at one time. Our three quantum bits can be in every possible state, all eight states, at the same time. Creating a quantum program usually follows the same pattern. And we initialize, compute, and then measure. In the compute phase, we usually put our qubits into a superposition state using the Hadamard gates. This creates a linear superposition of all possible states with coefficients that represent the equal probabilities of each of the states. C1 through C7 are the probability amplitudes associated with the system being measured in that state. These coefficients are the same as the alpha and the beta in our original definition of a qubit on slide 14. We then apply quantum operators to the superposition state and then measure our final state. Our result is the state with the highest probability. Simply put, our program applies a sequence of quantum operations to the superposition state in order to reduce the probability amplitudes of incorrect solutions and increase the probability amplitudes of desired solutions. The fact that our result is just the solution with the highest probability 
means that we have to run our circuit many times to actually get the right answer. And we'll see this when we look at the IBM quantum experience. Let's look at some of the reasons why people are so excited about quantum computing and some of the areas where quantum computing may have a major impact. We can get a sense of the computational power of a quantum computer by looking at the equivalent classical requirement to simulate a quantum computer. Looking at the diagram on the left, to simulate a 30 qubit system would take a reasonably powerful laptop. Just adding an additional 10 qubits would require a small supercomputer. Doubling that again to 80 qubits, and we need all of the computers on Earth. Doubling again to 160 qubits, and there's not enough silicon on the planet to build enough classical computers. So you can see that just a small increase in the number of qubits requires massive increases in the classical resources required. The table on the right from IBM Research compares the time taken for a classical algorithm with exponential runtime and compares that with an equivalent quantum solution with polynomial runtime. If the classical algorithm with exponential runtime takes 10 seconds to execute, then the equivalent quantum algorithm would take one minute. If the problem size is increased so that the classical algorithm now takes two minutes, the equivalent quantum algorithm would also take two minutes. If we increase the problem size again so that the classical algorithm now takes 330 years, the quantum equivalent would only take 10 minutes, increasing again so that the classical problem takes 3,300 years, the quantum problem takes 11 minutes increasing the problem to the point where the classical algorithm would take all of the time in the universe, the quantum algorithm would still only take 24 minutes. From this, you may get a sense of why many people are very excited about the potential for quantum computing. We already know a number of algorithms that have proven advantage over known classical solutions as the size of the problem grows. Simulation, factoring and linear systems, the complexity grows exponentially as the size of the problem grows. The quantum equivalent only grows polynomially as the size of the problem grows. As we saw on the previous slide, the time difference between solving a classical algorithm with exponential runtime and a quantum algorithm with polynomial runtime can be staggering. 24 minutes versus the lifetime of the universe. Optimization is an interesting case. It is hard to prove that the quantum solution has exponential advantage, but there is good empirical evidence to suggest that the quantum solutions do indeed show exponential advantage. Search only has a polynomial advantage over the classical solution, but even that is very significant for large problem sizes. So here we show some of the areas where quantum computing is being actively researched and applied in machine learning, optimization, and in simulation. However, the application is much broader than these three categories, and we are seeing the potential applications grow as more people have access to small-scale quantum computers to start exploring potential algorithms across a broad range of problems. Investment from government has been significant and is still growing with leading countries being the USA, China, Europe, Canada, Australia and Japan. Large corporates are also investing significantly, particularly IBM, Microsoft and Google. While the defence industry has had an interest in quantum computing since its inception in the 1980s, companies such as Lockheed Martin and Raytheon are now applying quantum computing to real-world problems. Investment in startups in the space has also taken off with over 200 startups across all components of the ecosystem in hardware, software communications and in consulting. While not long ago quantum computers sounded like science fiction, 
today they are very real and you can easily get access to one online. IBM, Microsoft and AWS all provide easy access to quantum computing that you can use as you would any other cloud service or software as a service. Google, Rigetti and others also provide online access but these three are probably the easiest for most people. The IBM Quantum Experience provides online access to the IBM superconducting qubits ranging from 5 qubit systems to 15 qubit systems and multiple simulators. Programming is via the online console or through Qiskit, the Python SDK for programming the quantum computers on IBM. IBM makes a number of quantum processors available from a number of providers, including Honeywell, IonQ, CSI, and also provides multiple simulators. IBM have developed their own specific language for programming their quantum computers called Q Sharp. If you're familiar with C Sharp, Q Sharp won't be much of a challenge for you, and it's a reasonably easy language to learn. AWS also provides access to a number of quantum systems from various vendors, including Rigetti, IonQ, D-Wave, and the multiple systems simulators as well. AWS also provide their own SDK for Python language programming of the quantum systems. Today we'll be exploring the IBM Quantum Experience, a cloud-based quantum computing service from IBM. In your web browser, head over to quantum-computing.ibm.com. You will be presented with a login for the IBM Quantum. You will first need to create an IBM ID. Simply click on the link here to create your ID. Once you have validated your ID via email, you simply can return to the Quantum Experience homepage and log in using your new IBM ID. Once logged in, you will be at the IBM Quantum Dashboard. From here, you will need to copy an API key that we will require for the next steps. It's installing the Qiskit Python SDK. If you already have Python 3 installed, you can simply run the pip install command to install Qiskit. But I suggest you install Anaconda and set up a separate environment. Once Anaconda is installed, Run the conda create command. Specify the name of the environment you want to use and you need to specify that the Python version you're using is Python 3. Then activate your conda environment, passing in the environment name you set up in the previous command. Once the conda environment is set up and active, simply issue the pip install qiskit command to install the Qiskit SDK. You'll need to separately install the Visualization Kit. Note on Zshell, you need the parentheses around Qiskit Visualization. Once the installation completes, execute Python, import the, SD import the Qiskit SDK, and then issue the following command qiskit dot two underscores qiskit underscore version two underscores this should return the output below giving you the versions of the packages that have been installed if you see this okay then you have completed the installation correctly so let's break out here and explore the IBM quantum composer and we'll run a Hello World example in both the Composer and in the Qiskit SDK. Once you log into the IBM Quantum Experience, you arrive at the IBM Quantum Experience dashboard. So let's have a look around the dashboard. Over here on the right are recent updates and recent notifications about changes to the quantum computers that are available. We mentioned in the earlier presentation that you'll need an API token to install the Qiskit SDK. This is where you can find your API token. Just click on the little double box here 
and it will copy the token to the clipboard for later use. Here we have some previous programs that we've run. Here we can launch labs, which are for learning. And here we can launch the composer. This panel shows us what systems are available to us, the number of quantum systems and the number of simulators. And this is where our previous jobs and our pending jobs will show up. So let's launch the composer. For our quantum hello world, we'll create a new file. And let's have a look around the composer. So across the top here are all of the quantum gates that are available to us. We've already been introduced to the Hadamard gate, the H gate, which puts our qubit into a superposition state. This is the X gate, or the NOT gate. And this is the C NOT gate. Here, the lines running from left to right represent our qubits, qubit 0, qubit 1, qubit 2. The lines marked C3 at the bottom represent classical registers. These are the registers that our qubits, once measured, get written to these registers. Over to the right here, we have what's called the phase disk. This disk updates in real time to give us an idea of what is the potential state of our qubit, whether our qubit will be most likely in the state of ket1 or most likely in the state ket0 and what are the phase angles of the state or of the qubit. Along the bottom we have some visualizations. How do we want to visualize the state of our, of our system of our qubits? We can look at the probabilities, we can look at the state vector and we can look at what's called the q-sphere. So the q-sphere is like a block sphere but you can represent multiple qubits on, this q, on the q-sphere. On the right hand side, we have our quantum assembly language. So this is the assembly language that defines our quantum circuit. At the moment, it's defining three quantum registers for us and three classic registers. For our quantum hello world, we only need two of each, so let's update that. As you can see, as we update the quantum assembly, it's updated the circuit diagram in real time. So let's now start to build the quantum circuit. The first thing we need to do is put qubit zero into a superposition state. So we'll grab a Hadamard gate and apply it to qubit zero. You'll see that the visualizations in the bottom have updated to reflect the changes that we've made to the circuit. And our phase disk is updated as well. It's now showing that the probability of this qubit being in the state Ket1 is 50%. That means the probability of it being in the state Ket0 is also 50%, which makes sense because that's what the Hadamard gate does. It puts our qubit into a superposition state. Now let's apply the C0 gate. So what the C0 gate has done is now entangled the two qubits. You'll see our visualization is updated at the bottom to represent the two, the two possible states that are now available to us of the four previously possible states. The phase disks have updated and also the chasm has updated to reflect the operations that are now being applied to each of the qubits. So now we need to figure out, now we need to measure our qubits. So let's grab the measure gate and apply it to qubit zero. And we'll take a measure gate and we'll apply it to qubit one. Whoops, that was the wrong gate. That's a reset gate. So let's delete that. And let's grab the right gate this time and apply the measure gate to qubit one. Okay. And now you can see, again, the chasm is updated. And also the state vector simulator is updated and the Q-sphere is updated. 
these visualizations are updated in the background in real time based on a simulator and the simulator is driven by this visualization seed at the top here and if we go back and repeat these steps we'll always get the same results for this circuit because it's driven by this seed if we want to change the outcome of this simulation we need to change this seed so let's go ahead now and run this on a on a on a on another quantum simulator and then let's go ahead and we'll run it on an actual quantum computer so here we click the setup and run and then let's select a simulator that we want to run it on. So let's run it on the state vector simulator. I should just run it on the CASIM simulator. We can then also select the number of shots we want to run. In this case we leave it at 1024 shots and then we click run to run the IBM simulator. This now indicates that the simulation is running. This now indicates that the job has been sent. So let's go look at the jobs. Click our jobs. And we can see that the job has just completed. And then we can see the results of the job. Completed. We can see the details of what was run, number of shots, number of circuits, and we can see a, a histogram that was showing the probability of the results. In this case, our simulator ran the result 00, 0542 times, and it ran the result 11482 times. So if we now want to go and run this circuit again on a real quantum computer, let's go back to set up and run. Now let's select a quantum computer that hasn't got too many jobs in its queue. Melbourne has 145, Manila had three. Let's select Manila. Again, we'll leave the shots at 1024 and then let's click run. jobs been sent. Let's look at the jobs listing. We can see the state of this job is still pending. Let's just show the jobs that are pending. State is updated to running. And now the state is updated to complete and we can look at the result of the job. Again there's the details of the, the job and then the histogram of the results of the job. And that's our quantum hello world using the IBM circuit composer. For our Qiskit version of Hello Quantum World, we first need to run a Jupyter Notebook, so let's do that now. From the Jupyter Launch page, let's go over to New, and let's launch a new Python 3 Notebook. 
So to, so to create our quantum circuit, we first need to import some libraries from Qiskit. So from Qiskit import, support quantum circuit, and, and assemble. These libraries allow us to create a quantum circuit, to find a back end for executing our quantum circuit and for assembling our quantum circuit into a runnable object. So let's also import something for visualizing um, our circuit and our results. So from Qiskit visualization, let's import plot histogram. Now we can create our first part of our quantum circuit. So QC equals quantum circuit. And we want to create a quantum circuit with two qubits. We can now use the draw function to see what our quantum circuit looks like at any point so we can see the progress as we're building it. So let's just do QC.draw and see what this circuit looks like. You can see there it's simply composed of a, a qubit zero and a qubit one at the moment. We can make that output uh, a little prettier by specifying that we want to use the matplotlib to output our quantum circuit. Let's do that now. Ah. Okay, the next step, we need to apply the Hadamard gate to qubit zero, so let's do that now. So QC, call the H function, and we want to apply that to qubit zero, so we specify zero in the function call, and then let's execute that, and let's plot our, let's draw our diagram again to see what our progress looks like. And then you can see the Hadamard gate applied to qubit zero. Our next step is to apply the C0 gate across qubit 0 and qubit 1. So let's do that now. So we've got CX for the, for the C0 gate. And then we want to apply 0 as the control bit and qubit 1 as the target bit. Let's look at our circuit again. Now we can see the Hadamard gate against Q0 and the C0 gate applied from Q0 to Q1. Now all we need to do is measure the outputs of our qubits and we can do that by calling measure all and that'll apply a measure gate to each of the qubits in the circuit. Oops don't need that capital there. Let's run that again. It's one of the good things about the, uh, the Jupyter Notebooks. So let's draw our circuit again to see what's on, what it looks like. And you can see Qiskit's put a, put a nice barrier there for readability. And it's added a measure gate on qubit zero and qubit one. And it's putting the results in two classical registers zero and register one. So that's our circuit complete. Now we need to run our circuit. So to do that, we need to get a back end for running the circuit. So let's get uh, SV back end equals dot get back end. And let's get a state vector simulator. our back end. Oh, and what have we done there? Another capital. So let's get rid of that. No fat thumbs today. So we've now got our back end. Let's assemble our circuit. Let's call it blob equals assemble and we'll pass in the circuit to be assembled. 
Okay, let's now find the results of our of our circuit. So our result equals our we call our circuit back end and we call the run function and we'll pass in our blob and we'll ask for the result. Now let's see what the results look like. To do that we'll use the plot histogram and we'll pass result and we'll ask to get the counts of the result. And there you have it. This circuit was collapsed to the state 0, 0. And that's our quantum hello world in Kiskit. While the potential for quantum computing is very exciting, there are some current limitations to quantum computing that have to be considered. The current systems we have access to are called NISC systems, noisy intermediate scale quantum. In the first part of our presentation, we looked at an IBM quantum computer and saw that it had to be cooled to near absolute zero to isolate it from noise. By noise, we mean thermal noise or other forms of energy that will disrupt or change the state of the qubit. With the best technology we have available now, we can only maintain the qubit state for a very short time. For example, the time that a typical superconducting qubit can maintain accurate state is just 0.1 milliseconds. Quantum error correction can be applied to reduce the impact of noise, but it has drawbacks of requiring many additional qubits. The systems that we have access to today online have between 5 and 16 qubits. The largest we have available to the general public on IBM Quantum is 15 qubits. There are systems with qubit counts around 100, but these are generally only available for internal research or made available to commercial partners. There's a lot of research into quantum error correction, but one of the drawbacks of error correction is that it increases the number of qubits required for an algorithm by 5 to 10 times. While we are still a way off the qubit count needed for practical solutions, the pace at which the qubit count is increasing is starting to exceed that of Moore's law. So, how many qubits do we need before we are implementing practical, usable in daily life solutions on quantum computers? It's a very hard question to answer, as things are changing in this space at such an incredible rate. Google recently published a paper outlining a method for factoring 2048-bit RSA using only 20 million qubits. A very interesting aspect of that paper is the rate at which the number of qubits required has been reducing. Between 2009 and 2019, the number of qubits required has decreased steadily from 6,500 million qubits to just 20 million qubits. That's a decrease in the order of 100 times in the space of 10 years. This decrease in the number of required qubits is being reported in many other areas of research as well. Many factors are driving the increased efficiency of quantum computers. Recently that growth rate has been called Nevin's Law. Nevin's Law states that quantum computers are gaining computational power relative to classical ones at a doubly exponential rate a staggering pace of change. Given that the average CPU currently has about 50 billion transistors, it's not hard to see that we might hit the required count for practical usage in the not too distant future. Well, this really has been a whirlwind tour and I hope it has whet your appetite for understanding more about this incredibly interesting topic. This section will give you an idea of where you can go to find out more information about quantum computing.
before you jump into the deep end, you really should get up to speed on the basics of linear algebra. You really do need to understand the core linear algebra concepts. I found the two sites here, three blue, one brown, and the Khan Academy site to be very good. You should try and grasp at a basic level the following concepts. Matrix addition and matrix multiplication. Determinants, the transpose of a matrix, and the inner product called the dot product and the outer product plus tensor products. You also need to understand what are eigenvectors and their eigenvalues. Next, let's look at some online resources. For IBM, go to kiskit.org slash learn. There are several learning resources listed there, but I suggest you start with the first three chapters of the Kiskit textbook and then explore some of the other resources from there. For Microsoft Azure Quantum, check out the Microsoft Quantum Computing Fundamentals. I found this to be a gentler introduction than the Kiskit tutorial, and learning q -sharp was not difficult. If you want to go further down the rabbit hole, these courses are excellent, and I highly recommend the MIT XPro courses. There are two certificate programs consisting of two courses per program. Each course will take about four weeks and you need to commit about 10 to 12 hours a week. These courses cost around 2,000 US dollars per course, so about 4K per certificate. edX.org is also a great site for online university quality courses and most of them you can run for free and only pay if you want the official certificate. You'll also need some fireside reading to gain a deeper understanding of this subject. I'd like to recommend three books. From the left, Quantum Computing from Pragmatic Programmers is a good gentle introduction to the subject. Then Quantum Computing Since Democritus by Scott Aronson tackles the subject from a computer scientist's perspective. It assumes you know a little bit more than I know about core computing science topics so a little time on Wikipedia is required for this one. The Nielsen Chuang book is considered the Bible on this subject. It is a little math heavy for me, but have found it useful as a reference for certain topics. Definitely not the best place to start if you're looking for an introduction though. Well, that concludes our whirlwind tour of quantum computing. I hope it has piqued your interest in this subject and given you a few starting points for finding out more about an incredibly interesting technology and one that I'm sure is going to have an incredible impact on the world in the future. Thank you for your time today.